Welcome to the Fast Leader Podcast, where we explore convenient yet effective shortcuts that will help you get ahead and move forward faster by becoming a better leader. And now, here's your host, customer and employee engagement expert, and certified emotional intelligence practitioner, Jim Rimbaugh. Call Center Coach develops and unites the next generation of call center leaders. Through our e-learning and community, individuals gain knowledge and skills in the six core competencies that is the blueprint that develops high-performing call center leaders. Successful supervisors do not just happen. So go to callcentercoach.com to learn more about enrollment and download your copy of the Supervisor Success Path eBook now. Okay, Fast Leader Leading, today I'm excited because we're going to have somebody on the show today who really helps us bring some clarity to high performance. Alan Stein Jr. was born and raised in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. He is the son of two retired elementary school educators and has a younger brother that he works closely with. Alan was incredibly active as a child and gravitated to any activity that involved movement and expending energy, from conventional sports like soccer, basketball, and football to less conventional activities like martial arts, breakdancing, and BMX biking. And while he enjoyed aspects of each, his true love has always been basketball. That was Alan's first identifiable passion. Alan was able to play basketball at Elon College, now Elon University, down in North Carolina, not too far from me, and began to develop an equal affinity for performance training, strength and conditioning, and basketball-specific fitness. That led him to a 20-year career as a professional basketball performance coach where he was able to work with alongside and closely observe the best players and coaches in the game. Always looking for a new challenge and consistently reinventing himself. Two and a half years ago, Alan decided to make the pivotable, the the pivot, (laughs) pun very much intended, as he says, into corporate speaking. He is now a keynote speaker and author that teaches audiences how to utilize the same strategies in business that elite athletes use to perform at a world-class level. Alan is also the author of Raise Your Game, High Performance Secrets from the Best of the Best. This book was written for leaders in sports and business and takes a deep dive into the mindsets, rituals, routines, habits, and disciplines required to reach peak performance, influence, and significance. Alan is a 43-year-old amicably divorced father of nine-year-old twin sons, Luke and Jack, and a seven-year-old daughter, Layla. He still resides in the suburbs of DC, but has and is fortunate enough to travel around the world. Alan Stein, are you ready to help us get over the hump? I'm always ready. Excited to be here, my friend. I'm glad you're here. Now, I've given my legion a little bit about you, but can you tell us what your current passion is so that we can get to know you even better? I'd say if we have to, you know, uh, brush away all the cobwebs, my true passion is just filling other people's buckets. You know, I, I very much consider myself a servant leader and take tremendous pride in, in serving others and trying to add value to their lives, uh, whether it's through something like a conversation like this for a podcast or in person, uh, old or young, in sport or in business, it doesn't matter. If, if I ever feel like I'm, I'm recharging somebody's battery or filling their bucket, that brings, brings me tremendous fulfillment. You know, it's interesting that you say that because, I mean, I, I, mean, I kind of have that same you know, need, that same passion, that same fulfillment, that same desire and as I was reading through your book, I started seeing a lot of that play out from different aspects, you know, of the, of the talking about high performance, right? So, you know, it's having that commitment as an individual, it's that whole self piece. Um, then it comes to being able to connect with people who can help you do that. So it's not just giving that, but it's also being able to receive that hmm. then do it in community or as a collective. And that's kind of how you actually have broken out the book. So you talk about player coach and team and you might also mention in the book something about that the trans transition into the business world and how very seamless and simple it is i see it because i'm involved with sport um i coach middle school baseball and you know i see how that has to play out and i also see these little middle school boys who really just don't know how to commit and play with one another treat each other with respect and i'm like Man, this is no different than the corporate world yeah, I mean, so so insightful with that point. And, you know, that's one of the things that's, that helped make this transition somewhat seamless is, uh, you know, how much transfer and crossover there is between what it takes to be successful in sport 
and what it takes to be successful in business or really in any area of, of life. And that the, the foundational principles uh, of leadership, uh, of building trust, of effective communication, of you know, learning how to respect someone and hold them accountable. I mean, those things, it really doesn't matter what industry you're in. Those principles are always going to be the same. And, you know, it's, that's why I'm such a, a big advocate of youth sports. And I'm so happy to hear that, that, that you're a coach um, because that's ultimately one of the, the major benefits. You know, I mean, the vast majority of the young people that play sports are not going to do so professionally when they're older. But man, sport can be such a tremendous vehicle and platform to teach these type of traits, uh, reinforce these characteristics, and provide life lessons that quite honestly are hard to get anywhere else. And I think I really started to get a much stronger appreciation for that when I became a father. And you know, my, my chief responsibility outside of protecting my children and providing for them is, is hopefully modeling and giving them the tools that they need to grow up to be happy, well-adjusted contributors to society. And I find that getting them involved in sports and activities and having them be coached uh, is going to help them do that uh, to a much greater degree than, than I could by myself. And even a greater to degree, you know, to what teachers can do. You know, I, I'm, I have a huge affinity and, and love for teachers because that's what both of my parents did. But let's be honest, you know, a, a math teacher is not going to be able to impact you in your life the exact same way as a baseball coach or a basketball coach. So it's important to be involved in as many of these things as possible for true development. Oh, wow. I never really thought about that whole classroom versus field issue. And my responsibility just got a lot bigger. I think I'm worried now. <laughs> <laughs> it did. And you know, what's funny is I know I positioned it that way. Uh, I, I don't want it to be a versus, but more of a, a supplement to each other that, you know, um, as parents, as coaches, as teachers, uh, we should all be concerned with working together to do what's best for a, a young person's development. And, and there's obviously glaring pros and strengths to each of those different domains. Uh, but I've just found that, that sport can really teach some life lessons that are very difficult uh, to teach as a teacher or even as a father. And, and that's why you know, I encourage my kids to try as many different activities and as many different sports as they can. And you know, that's also the reason I think my message is fairly well received in the business world is people know that intuitively. I mean, they know that what it takes to build a team uh, is going to be the same r regardless of what industry you're in or, or how old you are. Those principles, um, you know, they're, they're, they're always going to be true. Without a doubt. One of the things about the sport area is that it's experiential. You're practicing things. You're putting things into action. And a lot of times in a classroom, that isn't really happening. I mean, you're getting other, you know, insights and information that oftentimes really seems more difficult to apply. But also one of the things that, to me, as, you're, as we're talking about this, that really becomes crystal clear is that, talking about translating into the business world, is that if, we, if we're talking about serving customers, if we don't work together, if we don't have, you know, that, that feeling of self and our, our contribution, working collaboratively, all of those things, the customer experience gets affected as well. Oh, absolutely. And you know, when you talk about the classroom, um, a classroom for the most part, as much as you want collaboration and so forth, it's not really a team. It's, it's 30 individuals that are trying to learn on their own and they get their own grades. And you know, it's not the same as a team where if you and I are on a baseball team, you're counting on me. You need me to do my part. You need me to practice hard. You know, in a classroom, if the kid to my left doesn't do his homework, that doesn't affect me. But on a baseball team, if the kid to my left isn't going and doing batting practice, that could affect me. In fact, it will affect me because they're going to end up hurting our chance of being successful because they made the decision not to go the extra mile or to put in the extra work. So I think that is one of the biggest differences. And, and there's, again, there's pros to both. I mean, the, the self-reliance and the self-accountability of just being a solo student, uh, there's great traits from that. But I think the team component is what makes team sports so special. And then that's what's akin to business. Uh, where, as you said, in business, if you're not doing what you're supposed to do and you're in the desk next to me, you could potentially be taking lunch off of my plate. And that's where, that's where I just see so much harmony and alignment between team sport and business. And these are all really good points. And, and I, I mean, for me, I want to get into talking about your book, Raise Your Game, because 
there are three things that stood out to me as I was going through this book. And, you know, we, I mentioned again, it's in three parts, it's player, coach, and, and team. However, if you were to start to think about, you know, real estate, uh, as far as a book is concerned, where is most of the, the, the content actually residing? There's three things that stood out to me. One is self-awareness. That was a huge chunk. Yep. Uh, and then another chunk was going into the team part under communication and cohesion. So tell us a little bit about why those three take up more real estate in this book than the others. I'm a huge believer that self-awareness is the foundation to not just performance, but to happiness, fulfillment, respect, influence, success, significance. I mean, you fill in the blank, uh, but those things would be impossible to achieve uh, if, if you're not aware. And uh, I always find self-awareness rather comical because I, I find it very analogous to driving. Uh, very few people admit that they're a bad driver, but you know, you spend five minutes out on the road, we know there's plenty of bad drivers out there. Uh, there's not very many people, I think, that would step forward and raise their hand and say, I'm not self-aware. I think most people think they are self-aware, but it's been my experience that a vast majority are not, or at least are not as aware as they're capable of. And the, the whole key with self-awareness is we have to know a starting point. Like we have to know where we are. Uh, that's one point, And then we have to know where we're going. And it's, it's no different than GPS. I mean, if right now, if someone said, you know, uh, hey, Jim, hey, Alan, how do you get to Chicago? Well, your answer is going to be different because you're coming from Greensboro, North Carolina. I'm coming from Gaithersburg, Maryland. So we're not starting from the same point. Um, but you can't give someone directions to where, they're, to where they want to go if you don't know where they're starting. You have to have both points on the spectrum. So self-awareness, um, and, and there's several different levels to self-awareness, but, but self-awareness is crucial to knowing what you do well, what you love to do, you know, what, what, what drives you and motivates you, uh, what's your learning style, you know, what's your personality style, how do you best feel appreciated, knowing all that stuff. But then you also have to do the hard work and face what I would call the darker side, which is, you know, what, what things scare you? What are your insecurities? What are your challenges? Uh, what are your blind spots? And of course, by definition, you may not know what your blind spots are, but do you have the humility to acknowledge that you do have them, that you don't have all the answers and that you need help? And uh, kind of putting all of those things together will give you an awareness of, of who you are as a person and then, of course, where you fit in with the organization. And, you know, the example I use all of the time in basketball is a, a player that takes a bad shot, you know what, the coach can live with that. We can teach that. But a player that takes a bad shot and doesn't know it was a bad shot that's the dangerous one because they're going to continue to repeat that behavior and they don't even know they did anything wrong in the first place. So uh, self-awareness is absolutely uh, the foundation to which the rest of the house is built. Yeah, well, there's another part of that book uh, in that particular section that I like too that you've addressed is that coachability component because, you know, with the self-awareness, you have to have the humility and be coachable uh, and take that to try to make some changes. And if, you don't, if you're not going to take the, the coaching, now, how much are you going to actually have impact on the team? Very well said. That's the number one trait that I would look for after self-awareness and, and someone that I was working with, whether it's a, a young person on your baseball team or a, a CEO or an executive of a Fortune 500 company is, are they coachable? Because in order to be coachable, uh, you have to blend in openness with uh, – you know, allowing yourself to be vulnerable, but as we just said, having the humility to acknowledge that you don't have all the answers. And, you know, that's one of the things that's been cool about being around some of these high performers, you know, whether it's Kobe Bryant or LeBron James or, or Stephen Curry or Kevin Durant. I mean, these guys are already in the upper 0.01% of the human population at their specific craft, and yet they're all very open to being coached. In fact, they crave it. They beg to have someone in their life that can help them get just a little bit better. Now, when you've achieved the, the level of expertise and mastery that they have, there's not very many people um, that can coach you because there's not very many people that can, that can add to what you need to do because you're already so accomplished. Uh, and that's why they crave those people even more. But uh, yeah, coachability is, has to be a number one 
uh, mindset. And that, that also parlays a lot into, you know, Carol Dweck, who wrote the book Mindset, uh, the difference between a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. You know, uh, to be coachable, you have to have a growth mindset and believe that improvement is, is still not only possible, but will result in all of the work that you put in. Most definitely. Okay, so then going into the team side, we talked about a lot of uh, the uh, um, real estate, as I called it in the book, being reserved for communication and then, then cohesion. So why those two? It, it's my belief that I would say almost every single dysfunction within a team uh, is from one or two things. It's either from selfishness or it's from communication or, and usually uh, lack of communication or miscommunication, uh, or at least within a couple degrees of that. Communication is vital. And there's a few things that's so important to realize in a team atmosphere. Uh, one, you're always communicating something. Even when you don't think you're communicating, you're absolutely communicating something to your teammates or those that you lead. And, you know, the obvious is the nonverbals, which everyone talks about, you know, body language and eye contact, facial expressions and tonality. Uh, but I'm talking more about the unconscious message uh, that we send in all of our behavior. Um, uh, a great example, and this happens all the time, especially in the corporate world, would be if you and I are working on a team together and we're working on a project and I delegate an important task to you. The unconscious message is, I believe in you. I trust you. I know that you're competent enough to do this well. That's the reason I'm asking you to do it. And, and that unconscious message uh, is a glue that will strengthen our connection. Conversely, and this happens just as often, if I micromanage you, so I give you a task, but then I either literally or figuratively stand over your shoulder and breathe down your neck while you try to complete it, well, now I'm sending a completely different unconscious message. I'm basically saying, Jim, I don't trust you. I don't believe in you. In fact, I think you're such a moron. There's no way you'll get this done if I'm not standing over you. And that's going to erode our connection. And ultimately, every interaction we have with a teammate is either going to strengthen our connection or erode it. And we have to be very intentional about making sure that we are, as I said in the beginning, filling buckets and making deposits and, and strengthening every connection. So, of course, you know, more times than not, if I was micromanaging you, I would have noble intent. You know, I'm probably very particular that this thing gets done to a certain level. And, you know, uh, I've worked really hard to develop the skill sets to perform at a high level. And I want to make sure that it gets done to that quality. Uh, but the problem is that's not the message that you internally receive. You look at it as, Alan doesn't trust me, he doesn't believe in me. And that will start to pull the yarn out or the thread out of our relationship. And then ultimately, we'll start to evaporate our team cohesion. So that's a big portion of it. And, and another big part of communication uh, is the listening. And you know, I'm a professional speaker. I get paid to talk. But I, I know that the real gold is in the listening. And, and that's where you can really form strong connections. And, and, and same thing with a underlying message. I mean, right now, you're doing a brilliant job of actively listening to me as I, I continue to talk. And whether you're listening to me it's, or it's your listeners are listening to us, when you actively listen to someone, you send them the unconscious message that you care about them, that what they have to say is important that you value what it is that they're saying. And once again, that is a glue that will strengthen any connection. You know, if you're talking to someone, if, if you and I are out to lunch and I'm talking to you and you keep looking down at your phone and you keep looking out the window and just kind of, you know, obligatorily nodding your head, I know that you're not really listening to me. And then unconsciously, you're telling me that I'm not important and that you don't value me. And if that's done repeatedly over time, that will erode our connection. And if that's done in mass consistently, it will start to dissolve any type of team cohesion and culture. So communication is absolutely vital and, and is pivotal to the greater picture of cohesion. You know, as you're talking, I started thinking about one of the practices that I've tried to do more and more of is to be able to convey what my intent is because I want to remove the potential doubt and the you know assumptions that people will make in regards to you know my actions as far as some of the things that you're talking about so hey if i am very particular and i this is very important to me and i and i will you know be able to you know look over your shoulder a lot more than i would this is why yes you know, and be able to convey that because i think 
once you get past, you know, that, you know, eerie, you know, gray of perception, uh, you're, you're much better off and you can actually create better connections because I think people are going to be more intentive when you say how, you know, it is important what your intent is. And also, you also open yourself up for feedback to say, I know this is what your intent is. However, this is what I'm perceiving. Absolutely. And that comes back to communication. In that instance, you would be effectively communicating uh, your intent and doing your best to dissolve any type of assumptions or preconceived notions or judgments and be able to explain that. And then that also parlays into that would show your ability to, to welcome feedback and to be coachable where you could say to me in this instance, you know, Alan, uh, uh, let me apologize in advance if it seems like I'm micromanaging you, but I need to make sure this is done right. Please know that I really do trust you and believe in you or I wouldn't have asked you to do this. I know you're competent, but I'm going to keep an eye on you. However, if you feel like I'm stepping on your toes a little bit, uh, don't be afraid to push back. Don't be afraid to tell me that and give me that feedback. You know, that type of dialogue is incredibly productive. And ultimately, what that would tell me unconsciously, wow, Jim does care about me. He, he's cared so much that he's already looking forward and seeing that this could pot potentially create an issue and he's heading that off at the pass and that he's open for me to share my honest feelings with him. That, that will completely, um, you know, again, close that gap of connection between us. So no, very, very well said. So without a doubt, everything that we're talking about here is just loaded with emotion. And one of the things that we look to on the show are quotes to help guide us in the right direction and give us some inspiration. Is I there love quotes. Oh, good. Can you share one or, two, one or two with us? You know, I can share a few because uh, as a father of three, it's very similar. If you ask me which of my children I love the most, you know I'm going to have to say all three because that's the only politically correct answer. Uh, and it happens to be true. Uh, but same thing with quotes. You know, one of the things with quotes... Uh, I, I started writing down quotes when I was in middle school, uh, back on an old school yellow legal pad with, with pen and paper, uh, and then of course graduated to a Microsoft Word document, and now I just have thousands of quotes because I really love language. Uh, there's several that I love. Um, uh, one is, and this one's a little bit longer and I've got a shorter version, but if you keep doing what you've been doing, you'll keep getting what you've been getting. If you don't like what you've been getting, you need to change what you've been doing. And I like that. Certainly, it's got a nice rhythm and, and flow to it. But it also reeks of common sense, which is if you want to get a different result, then you need to have different behavior. Uh, but I just like the way that, that it brings that up because most people continue to do the same thing over and over in their life. And then they're shocked when things don't get better, when their performance doesn't improve. And it's like, well, you're just doing the same stuff you've been doing. Why would your performance magically improve? Uh, you know, a, a shorter version of that is if nothing changes – nothing changes. So you have to be willing to make that change. So uh, I like those two. Um, you know, I, I also like, uh, you know, that if you're willing to do what others won't do, then you'll have what others won't have. And when I was younger, that always seemed to, to mean something monetarily or superficial. Like, you know, if you do things that others won't do, you'll make a lot of money and have some toys that they won't have. Uh, but now that I'm older and hopefully a little wiser, uh, I realize it's the same thing with happiness and fulfillment. You know, if you're willing to make certain sacrifices and, and do certain things that most people aren't willing to do, then you'll have a level of happiness and fulfillment that most people don't achieve. So those are just a couple off the top of my head, but we could do a whole podcast just on quotes. Oh, without a doubt. So I, I know that we can start talking about all of these quotes and all this inspiration and all of that and, uh, and you know, going through your book and looking at the things associated with, you know, <laughs> you know, being self-aware, humility, all of these things that you've had to have some humps to get over in order to get you to this point of, of knowledge and wisdom gain. So is there a time where you've gotten over the hump that you can share? Yeah, the most obvious one was, uh, and, and I know you had read it in my intro, and, and I, I used language very specifically and intentionally, but you mentioned that I'm amicably divorced. And uh, you don't often hear those two words in the same sentence. At least that's been my experience. And the reason I, I lead with that is I'm very proud of the fact that uh, even though my marriage didn't work out, that my ex-wife and I um, are very amicable and respectful of each other. And we make excellent co-parents to our children uh, because we both realize that, you know, uh, that, that how we treat each other is going to have a huge influence and impact on our children and that we owe it to them to do that in the most civil and respectable and loving way possible. Uh, so when I was going through the divorce, um, I actually decided to go in and get some counseling or, or some therapy or whatever word someone wants to use. 
And that was incredibly helpful and very enlightening. Uh, in fact, I, I, when I look back on myself, uh, I would like to believe that I've always had a good heart. As you mentioned, I've had good intentions. Uh, I think that I was a good guy. But boy, I had a lot of roadblocks and I had a lot of baggage. Uh, I wasn't near as self-aware um, as I am today. Uh, same thing, I, I lacked some humility before and, and therapy certainly helps course correct that. Uh, so going through some therapy and, and having somebody kind of unpack these things and, and guide me uh, has absolutely made me a better man, uh, which has allowed me to be a better father, uh, a better business person, a better speaker. Uh, and, and, you know, this happened five, six years ago. So, you know, I've spent the vast majority of my life uh, with some of those qualities that weren't quite as endearing. And it's, it's really neat now that that she, the therapist, really helped me get over that hump. And, and it was a very enlightening feeling, and I'm so thankful. And it's also, these things are not anything that you ever arrive at. Uh, I still do the work today, the internal work to sharpen my sword and master my craft and get better at these different areas. You know, I, I still work on my own self-awareness and clarity on a daily basis. And, and those things will ebb and flow. And, you know, I, I work hard to be coachable and open and every once in a while, I'll find there's times where I'm not and I'm a little resistant, uh, but I have now the tools where I can take a step back and take a breath and go, okay, Alan, in that specific instance, you were not very open to that other person's idea. All right, we got to do better at that. So I'm um, very, very thankful to have gotten over at least that hump. And I'm sure I've got several more to get over for the rest of my life. Well, I think you bring up a, a, some really good points in all of that is that, you know, first of all, with, you know, focus and effort and support and help you know, that we can do things differently and get the outcomes that we desire, but we have to actually do those things. So, I mean, there's, there's several things that as I'm thinking about too, from an organizational perspective that are critically important, because we know that execution, executing, getting things done is really one of the major roadblocks for, for organizations. And even when you start talking about the customer experience, employee experience, and being able to deliver something that is exceptional, is they struggle. They struggle to be able to do all of these things from an individual perspective, from a team perspective, uh, and in order to be able to have the desired outcome. So when you're talking about working with organizations that are trying to be able to deliver and differentiate, where are you finding some of their big roadblocks? A couple things. One, uh, I encourage that regardless of what industry somebody's in, that they work to make their relationships and their culture, their major separator. Uh, because we, you know, we can copy technology, I mean, to a degree, we can copy systems and processes, we can copy uh, designs and layouts, we can copy prices. It's very difficult to copy people, uh, it's very difficult to copy relationships, uh, and it's very difficult to copy culture. Uh, so I, I love the way that you and I started this conversation talking about relationships and talking about uh, creating connection and, and so forth. Uh, I really encourage folks to make that their secret sauce and, and to pour into that um, because it'll, it'll pay them back heavily on, on the other end. You know, as far as some of the roadblocks, I mean, there's – it's, it's not really a one size fits all. I mean, every organization's uh, going to be slightly different uh, with the things that kind of get in their way. But one trend that I've noticed, you need to practice the way that you want to play. And this is another one that we can pull straight out of the, the playbook. You know, um, I would imagine on some level, and I know it varies depending on the age of the kid that you're working with, but I would imagine with the baseball practices that you hold, uh, a good portion of those, you're doing things that are working on skills exactly as they'll be needed when they play in the game. And, you know, uh, that, that certainly there's, there's ways to modify certain things, but, you know, I would imagine that, that you have different drills and different activities and different things that you do that try to closely simulate what the kids will see when the actual game starts. And I know for the basketball programs I've worked with, uh, that's a big portion of it too. You know, yes, they would have a, a fundamentals portion where they're working on skill work, but then they would do different situations and different scenarios and small-sided scrimmages and, you know, different time and score. They would try to mimic the game as much as possible. And, and that's what businesses need to do. They need to figure out what's the outcome that they're looking to get and then how can they best simulate that uh, in their training or in their practice. A perfect example would be uh, with sales, any type of sales professional, you know, um, it may sound a little cliche and corny, but, you know, are they doing any type of role playing? 
You know, if you and I are both sales professionals and we have to sell, you know, widgets for our company, uh, you and I should have 30 minutes a week that we're going back and forth and this time you pretend you're the customer and I want you to come up with some objections and I'll be the salesperson and then we'll flip it and we'll do something, you know, where, where uh, I'll be the customer and you'll be the sales professional and let's, let's go through as many of these scenarios as possible. So that way when you actually get to a big sales meeting or you have a proposal, you're not hearing these objections for the first time. You've prepared for them, you know, uh, the same way that I would prepare to be a guest on your podcast or the way that I would prepare to deliver a keynote, uh, there has to be a preparation component. And sometimes I think folks fail uh, to close the gap between um, what they need to do in preparation and what's going to actually be recalled when it's game time. I think those are really important points. Uh, and that applies to just about, you know, every single customer facing job uh, that I come across is that. You know, if you're waiting to figure it out until you get in it, you're in trouble. Yeah. And, and think too, now, uh, it doesn't mean we can come up with every scenario, but let's just say you and I do, we're sales professionals, we're teammates. Yeah, we're each working on our own commission. However, we want to work together because we still want the business to do well. That's very similar to a team where two players are fighting for playing time but they're wearing the same jersey. But let's just say we do this role playing uh, and then I have a customer come in and they throw me a curveball that I've never seen before. I've never heard this objection. And, and now, you know, I, I haven't practiced this specifically, but there's two things to take from that. One, if we've practiced other things, I can probably bridge the gap between some of the other scenarios and find ways to apply that to this. So it doesn't mean that I have to have been asked that very specific question, but just the routine of practicing and going through role playing will better prepare me for that. But then whether I answer it well or, you know, I swing and I miss and I strike out to use some of your uh, vernacular, then the key would be to go back to the team afterwards and say, Jim, man, that was a rough call I just had. I can't believe it. The client, the client asked me this and I had no idea what to answer. Uh, what do you think? What would you have said if they ask you this? Or, you know, can we brainstorm this together? And now I've got that one logged so that if someone ever asks that one again, I'll be fully prepared. So, and that's ultimately what experience is. You know, experience is the, the accumulation of all of these different things that we're doing. And that's why more times than not, outside of just say likability and raw charisma, a veteran sales professional is probably going to do better than a new sales professional because they've seen so many other um, scenarios. They've gotten in a lot more reps when it comes to selling. So uh, that would be something that I would highly encourage is, you know, we can have a, a, a sales meeting for 30 minutes a week where we do some role playing and then we all bring up some of the successes and challenges that we've had in recent calls. Because if I'm a good teammate, I'm also going to say, Jim, you're not going to believe it. Uh, the, the customer asked me this question and this was the answer I gave them and it blew their socks off. They, I mean, they started just throwing money at me. So I just wanted to share that with you in case someone ever asks you the same question that you'd be able to do the same thing for them. Yeah, we learn best in community. And so thank you for actually putting together this body of work and we hope you and Raise Your Game uh, get the very best that it deserves. Now, before we move on, let's get a quick word from our sponsor. An even better place to work is an easy-to-use solution that gives you a continuous diagnostic on employee engagement along with integrated activities that will improve employee engagement and leadership skills in everyone. Using this award-winning solution is guaranteed to create motivated, productive, and loyal employees who have great work relationships with their colleagues and your customers. To learn more about an even better place to work, visit beyondmorale.com forward slash better. Okay, here we go, Fast Near Legion. It's time for the Hump Day Hoedown. Okay, Alan, the Hump Day Hoedown is a part of our show where you give us good insights fast. So I'm going to ask you several questions. And your job is to give us robust yet rapid responses that are going to help us move onward and upward faster. Alan Stein, are you ready to hold down? I am ready to rock and roll. All right. So what do you think is holding you back as a better leader today? I still have a few limiting beliefs that I'm trying to work through. And, and I'll hear something at face value and sometimes dismiss it as something that I can't do. Uh, and I'm, I'm working now to be able to uh, break through and, 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 and have a limitless type belief. And what is the best leadership advice you have ever received? It's, it's not about you. It's about them. And, and that needs to be the, the lens at which you look through everything. As a leader, it's not about you. It's about them. And what's one of your secrets that you believe contributes to your success? I was taught at a very young age that you need to connect first and coach second. 
that, that uh, develop a care and a love for the people that you lead and connect with them on a human level first, and then you can work on leading them and coaching them. You can't do it if you reverse the two. What do you feel is one of your best tools that helps you lead in business or life? Uh, emotional intelligence, without question. And what would be one book that you'd recommend to our Legion? It could be from any genre. Of course, we're going to put a link to Raise Your Game on your show notes page as well. Uh, the first book that absolutely had a monumental impact on me was uh, Leading with the Heart by Coach K, the head coach of Duke men's basketball. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, you can find links to that and other bonus information from today's show by going to fastleader.net slash Alan Stein. Okay, Alan, this is my last hump day hold on question. Imagine you were given the opportunity to go back to the age of 25 and you can take the knowledge and skills that you have now back with you, but you can't take it all. You can only choose one. So what skill or piece of knowledge would you take back with you and why? I would take back self-awareness because at 25, I was severely lacking it. Um, I only had a very narrow view uh, of myself and, and, and the good and the bad. Uh, so absolutely, I'd go back with that self-awareness. And if the 25-year-old Alan would have been open to listening to that advice, uh, I think he could, have, he could have sidestepped a lot of heartache and, and landmines and challenges. Alan, it was an honor to spend time with you today. Can you please share with the Fast Leader Legion how they can connect with you? Absolutely. Well, it was a, a pleasure. It was very mutual. I enjoyed this conversation. You asked some wonderful questions. I had a lot of fun. Uh, if they're interested in the book, they can go to raiseyourgamebook.com. If they're interested in my speaking or anything else I do, they can go to allensteinjr.com. And I'm at allensteinjr on LinkedIn and Instagram and all of the major social handles. And I love engaging with people on social. Uh, so if anyone was listening to this, if something resonated uh, and you want to drop me a line, uh, I would love to start some dialogue. Alan Stein Jr., thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom. The Fast Leader Legion honors you and thanks you for helping us get over the hump. Thank you for joining me on the Fast Leader Show today. For recaps, links from every show, special offers, and access to download and subscribe, if you haven't already, head on over to fastleader.net so we can help you move onward and upward faster. <laughs>